pray. We're going to move forward with this portion of our conference today, which is our awards portion of the conference. And I always enjoy the award portion because it gives us an opportunity to recognize individuals who've done exemplary, exemplary work in tobacco control over the past 12 month period since we were here last September. Of course, this year we went through the usual process. We sent out a call for nominations for you to send in uh, people, or person, people, team, organization that you believe deserve to be honored for their tobacco control work. And we received a number of excellent, in my opinion, excellent nominations, which tells me that there are many people across the state who are doing a yeoman's job and working in tobacco control. However, we couldn't give everybody an award so the committee read the nominations, evaluated all of them, scored them, and there was one individual that kind of rose to the top. And that is the person we are going to honor today. That's the person we are going to recognize with our 2014 Trailblazer Award. Last year, we renamed the Trailblazer Award because it was just called Trailblazer. And we renamed it last year in memory of a former board member, Dr. Dan J. Hawkins out of Harrison, Arkansas. So now the award is known as the Dr. Dan J. Hawkins Trailblazer Award. So the second Dr. Dan J. Hawkins Trailblazer Award it's going to go to, usually I kind of make you wait. I will kind of give you some hints of uh, reading from the nomination, and then you kind of guess, well, who is that going to be? Is it me, or is it my neighbor? <laughs> who is it? Well, this year, with this nomination, you're going to automatically know who the person is. So I thought I'm going to do something just a little bit differently. I'm just going to tell you who the person is. I'm going to ask that person to come up. And then I am going to read some of the excerpts from the nomination so you will know, ah, that's why he or she was nominated. So at this time, I would like for mayor, so now you know it's an elected official, mayor, unless his first name is mayor, <laughs> Kevin Hatfield from Huntsville, Arkansas. Are you in the house? Is the mayor here? Oh, Mr. Mayor must be in the rain. <laughs> but that's OK, because we have his colleagues from here. And I'm going to ask Miss Brenda Patterson, do you mind coming forward? And as Brenda is coming forward, I want you to know last night I had the opportunity to have dinner with Brenda. And she was excited. I became excited because she was excited. And the, all the excitement was around her mayor traveling here today to receive the award because he was excited. So we're just thinking maybe it's weather. Nevertheless, she's going to take this award home to him. So come closer to me, Brenda. Brenda wrote many things about Mayor Kevin Hatfield. First, she wrote how he just took the reins and he worked on public issues, beautification issues, like uh, a policy to beautify their city square. Uh, there's a fountain put in called the Fountain of Valor, some things like that, all good stuff. But it's the second part of the nomination that really caught our attention, got traction, and said, hey, this guy is phenomenal. Brenda wrote something like this, so you, now you know that Brenda made the nomination. <laughs> so for you, make sure you send them in. We really do vote on them, and sometimes people even win. You know, at least one person's going to win, so make sure she's good, because this is your second or third one. Third. Three people out of her area. 
All good ones, yes, all good ones. Yeah, give her a hand. Yeah. Okay, so Brenda wrote, during the, during the event, Earth Day, the coordinator for Tobacco Coalition, Brenda Patterson, and the KAT, the acronym KAT group, Kids Against Tobacco team picked up cigarette litter in the parking lot and businesses around and in Huntsville. She went on to write, then they not only wanted to just house these butts, now you have them, what are you going to do with them? So of course, Brenda being the person that she is, that was a strategy to her madness. And she thought, I'm going to take the kit, the cat, cat. the cat, K-A-T group, these group of young people, to a city council meeting with all of these cigarette butts because she was working on advocating for a policy, right? Mm -hmm. She was advocating for a policy, and she thought all of these cigarette butts would surely, surely assist her in making her case. Well, we got to city council, Brenda, kids in tow, made a presentation. Mr. Mayor and the council members sitting around the table, and I can almost envision them sitting around and um, wanting to throw tomatoes at Brenda because she's there asking for a policy. But no, in that vision, that was the wrong vision because not Mayor Hadfield, he did not think that way. She, Brenda was asking for a policy and her kids made this wonderful presentation. They had evidence by showing, look at all of this litter, cigarette litter in our parks and around our businesses just shouldn't be. They talked about how long litter actually stay in existence, the harmfulness to kids and animals, and the whole spiel that we do when we're talking about cigarette litter. They did it where the mayor decided, you know what, Brenda, we can give you more than what you asked for. I think we need to do an ordinance and make it enforceable. We not only want a law on the books, but we want it enforced. The chief of police, I believe, was at this meeting, and he turned to the chief. Mr. Chief, do you believe we can do that? The, of course, the chief of police said, yeah, of course we can do that. And Believe it or not, it was a done deal. She went for one thing, had the kids in tow, but because the mayor is a part of their coalition, so he's savvy and educated and informed about the press of tobacco, the benefits of tobacco-free policies, he just thought, yeah, that's good what you're asking for. Thank you very much, but we can do better. And he did so. And for that reason, the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas is recognizing Today, Mayor Kevin Hatsfield of Huntsville, Arkansas, as the Tobacco Control Advocate of the Year. It says, for your outstanding accomplishments and the fight against tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke, presented September 11, 2014, by the Coalition for Tobacco Free Arkansas. Brenda, would you like to have a few words on behalf of the mayor? <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And Mayor Hatfield is just so energetic and he's just so, he's just so there. He's such an advocate for the county that, but when I told him that he won this, he was so humble that he was like, well, I really didn't do anything. But I, and I don't really think he realizes how big it was the thing that he did. But um, I was able to purchase signs and they will be prohibited um, they, they, it is all and will be enforced. So I'm just proud that we have him as a mayor. So thank you. Listen, you know what? You see this pattern emerging. We had the mayor, uh, Mayor Rick Ellenbaum from Batesville, who's very proactive, public health minded. We have the mayor in Huntsville. I'm saying all of that to say that you have a mayor, most of you probably live in, Arkansas is small and we have very small towns, but most of us probably have a mayor, even those towns with 76 people call themselves having a mayor. And I will say to you that work with your mayor and get 
you know, on policy, educate them on why this is good public health. This is good for the community. This is good for Arkansas. So I just wanted to plug that. Now, I told you that each year we give out the Trailblazer Award. Just gave that. But this year, the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas, we have two additional awards that we're going to present. Two, one is a small business, the other is a large business. We're going to start with the small business first, and I'm going to tell you a little about this business and the business owner and why, and you will figure out why we are recognizing and honoring that business today. The Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas was looking for a business that we could actually again work with and gain some traction, reaching a subpopulation that we needed to actually work clo more closely with them, and that would be the African American um, male population. We did our brainstorming and we came up with a long laundry list on, you know, we know who they are, where do we find them. Me being an African American woman, you know, I see them, they're no stranger to me, I see them, but how do I get them in groups, you know, and so that we can, we work with them. And I had an epiphany, you know what, I don't do barbershops, but I know men go to barbershops, and I know from a group of friends that African-American men really love going to barbershops even if they don't utilize the service of the barbershop for the hair, they utilize the service for the camaraderie, for the friendship, for the connections. They would go early in the morning and stay until late in the evening. And I thought, we need one of those on our side. Well, it was more easy to think that thought than actually to get it done because not only <laughs> they're a business, they're in business to make some money and they didn't want to look like, okay lady, that's all good, but listen, I need to cut some hair. <laughs> but we found one business in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, in Jefferson County. When we approached him, the owner, he said, well yeah, come on, when you want to come? And I'm thinking like, oh okay. And I said, well what about we want to do this pre-Father's Day. We want to come to Friday and the Saturday before Father's Day. That's a good time to come. We have lots of men. I open at like 3 or 4 in the morning. Well, we won't be there that early, but, <laughs> but what about, about 7 or 8? We can get there. And he said yes. But through the collaboration, we were able in 2013 and again in June 2014, each visit to reach more than a hundred African American men and we were able to do testing with them, we were able to talk with them about the presence of smoking and I want you to know it was the right population, it was the right business because the vast majority of the individuals that stopped and had contact with us were smokers and we had, we signed people up for the quit line Last, uh, in, last June, we added a, an additional, uh, an additional a, a component to our work and we did blood pressure check, very similar to what we're doing here today. And several other men had that blood pressure check and I want you to know there were three that we remember on that Friday and that blood pressure was off of the chart. I think one had stopped taking their meds, one had stopped taking the meds only because he couldn't get his prescription filled, and the other one had no idea. And they got on the phone immediately with a healthcare provider who, and got them in to help them out to get that blood pressure down. And we attribute all of this because there was one business in the city of Pine Bluff open up their arms and hearts to us and say, hey, I believe in what you are doing. It's important work to us. Come on down. And so now we're going to invite Pops, the owner of Pops Barbershop, to come on up and to accept this award. I'm going to read it. 
Um, since the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas proudly honors Pop's Barbershop for its community service work that protect the health of the public and save lives, it's presented September 11, 2014, Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas. I'd just like to say thank you for this award, and I'm glad I can be a help to the to people here in the communities in Alton, in Pamela, and the surrounding areas. Thank you. Yeah, in addition to that, I found out that he's just community service minded, and he mentioned all time in Arkansas, and I didn't know that until they told me, but he feeds about how many hundreds of people at this barbecue that he does, and I understand that they have really good food, and I'm still waiting for my invitation so I can come to the next one. Um, so anyway, it was just a joy to work with that barber shop, and it's a huge shop. It's about maybe 10, 12 chairs. You know, he was very brief in his remarks, but it's right there on Main Street. So if you're ever in the Pine Bluff area, just go by and say, "Hey, pops, thanks for doing a good job." Now the next award goes to a big business. Let me get it out. And this, this business, you guys, unless you've been under, under a rock the last 10 days or so, you've heard somewhere along the way CVS Pharmacies, you know, a Caremark changed its name, right? CVS Health, right? We know that. Well, guess what? When we heard that, because I remember back in February or so when they made the announcement and moving forward, the policy would go, they would actually go into effect, I think, like in October of this year. So I had heard about it, you know, and I was excited. But about, what, 19 days ago, if you, that news cycle, you remember hearing about it? And they decided, we're going to do this name change, and if we, if we do the name change, why wait another month to implement our policy? We're going to do it right now. I said, go CVS. I said, just as soon as I can, I am transferring my prescriptions over to you, and I'm going to do that. So um, let me just tell you something about the progression and, and why we're here. On February the 15th, 2014, CVS Pharmacy Caremark stunned the business community in the nation when it announced it would no longer sell tobacco products as of October 1st, 2014. And this uh, move is impacting 7,600 7, pharmacies. Foregoing two billion dollars of revenue annually. They're leaving this on the table, people. But CVS moral and social conscience led them to realize that the practice of selling <laughs> tobacco in the front of the store, I call killing in the front of the store and healing in the back of the store, no longer made sense to them. And they thought, like, we just need to drop that bad habit to the side. And they did. Now, $2 billion is something to leave on the table now. We know that. Because we know the tobacco industry is not leaving nothing. You know, we take it all. We take your babies. <laughs> we know that. And, but CVS figured, you know what? We make this business uh, decision. We're doing it for help. This is our mantra. We're gonna, our mission needs to line up. Our practice needs to line up with our mission. And so they made the decision uh, to do that. Not only that, they were adding many clinics, these clinics that they call minute, like a minute, second, minute, hour, you get it, uh, clinics, and they have over 600 of those. Like, okay, we have these clinics to help people, to heal them, to help health problems, but then we're gonna sell them tobacco. What kind of sense does that make? That's an oxymoron, if you ever heard one. Okay, and then they figured, you know what? 
We know that the same 480,000 people die from the tobacco, plus the other 50 plus thousand um, non-smokers die from secondhand smoke exposure. But they were concerned about this number, 16 million people who are living with tobacco-related diseases, you know, emphysema, COPD, and all of the other things, that they actually have drugs in the back to treat. But they feel like we're kind of the culprit. We, you know, we started on the front end and then treat them on the back end. We're not going to do that anymore. So for this reason, CVS decided today is today, and we're going to do the right thing. And I just want you to know that it has made the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas so happy. So today, we are going to recognize CVS Health Corporation for their proactive stance. So with Michelle Mitchell, come forward. Where are you? I come closer. Okay. Come closer. It says Certificate of Recognition, CVS Health Corporation. Your corporate responsibility, whereby putting human lives ahead of financial profits and your dedication to reducing tobacco use in the U.S., will ensure a healthier future for many generations to come. Thank you for the adoption and the implementation of your no sale of tobacco products policy presented this 11th day of September in the year 2004 by the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Arkansas and is signed by Catherine Donald, Executive Director. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I mean, thank everyone for this. It's, it's a real honor to accept this award in behalf of CBS. Our store opened on August the 31st. Um, and we opened without tobacco because they were we were pulling it out at the time our store opened. So we opened without it, but I can tell you that we had a great response from our customers. We had a few that weren't happy, but for the most part, we've had a great response from everyone that we've stopped doing this, uh, the sale of tobacco and cigarettes. So it, it's it's really it's really honoring to to get this for CBS. And let me just say this, our purpose, Catherine was saying earlier, it doesn't align with our purpose. The sole purpose of CVS, their mission, is to help customers on their path to a better health. And with that in mind, you know, pulling out cigarettes. Like she said, close to half a million people a year die from related deaths from cigarettes. So it was an important decision, and all of us that work for CVS, we're really proud of them because she, like Catherine said, it left money on the table but that's not what's important. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Those are our three awards. You can see we had three wonderful individuals and corporations doing great things and we are just honored to have the opportunity to recognize all three of the individuals representing the business the two businesses and the individual award and with this we're going to make ready for our next portion I want you to continue to enjoy your lunch because we're going to have a use a little bit of time what we're going to do is we're going to pinky few is going to honor us with his research project. He's going to share with us. I'm Pinky Few, Creative Director for Hansel Art and Advertising. This will be a short synopsis of an air quality study Julie and I did at Oaklawn and Southland earlier this year. This, was made, this study was made possible by the Arkansas Cancer Coalition's funding of a mini grant proposal I made and the gracious collaboration of the Arkansas Department of Health's, Health's TPCP program. Ruthie? The science is clear. Secondhand smoke is not a mere annoyance, but a serious health hazard. Uh, in 2006, 
Sergeant, Surgeon General Richard Carmona said this, even though the tobacco companies have yet to admit it, we know that secondhand smoke is deleterious to human health. Deleterious is uh, Dr. Thaddeus Barter's word. I, I like it. Uh, the purpose of this pilot project was to initiate data collection on secondhand smoke at two of the major exemptions to Arkansas's Clean Indoor Air Act of 2006, Oaklawn and Southland. Ruthie. Our methods involves discrete observation and measurement of fine particles using a TSI 510 side pack aerosol monitor. We sampled both racing and casino facilities during late afternoon, midweek to try and avoid overestimating our data with heavy traffic. Ruthie. At both venues, EPA standards for safe exposure to fine particulates for a 24 hour period were compromised. I took advantage of a really great resource on the web. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health offers a website that has tutorials for various different research options regarding secondhand smoke. It covers topics from biomonitoring, hair and saliva sampling, data analysis, air nicotine measurement, PM 2.5 measurement to simple observation and policy change options. It truly is a sophisticated and thorough investigation to just about all facets of secondhand smoke issues from collecting data to making the best use of that data. Our study involved using the aforementioned side pack to measure fine particulates. There are three video tutorials with instructions for setting the machine up, the collection protocol, and how to download and read the data. It's a great site. You really need to check it out. We know that tobacco smoke is the leading risk factor for cardiovascular disease and lung cancer. We know that secondhand smoke is the third leading cause of death. We know that tobacco smoke is made up of carbon monoxide, nicotine, and 4,000 plus other substances, many of which are carcinogens. Carbon monoxide robs the body, the heart, the brain of oxygen. We know that secondhand smoke stiffens blood vessels and makes the platelets sticky, inflaming the endothelial lining of blood vessels and compromises cardiac function, cascading the risk factors for heart attack and stroke. These 4,000 respirable fine particulates get inhaled deeply into the lungs. Tobacco smoke is not only deleterious, it will flat ass kill you, even if you don't smoke. The point of measuring very small particles, moistures and solids, is as noted because they are respirable, they hang in the air. You see the comparison here between dust and smoke vis-a-vis -a, -vis a human hair. The smallest referred to as PM 2.5, 2.5 micrometers or less, is about a 1 30th the size of the diameter of a human hair and readily inhaled deeply into the lungs. The EPA safe standard for average daily exposure for two, PM 2.5 is 35 micrometers per meter cubed. 2006 was a big year for tobacco-free advocates. We started with the Surgeon General's report, April 30th, ending the debate about the dangers of secondhand smoke. In August, Judge Gladys Kessler convicted the tobacco industry in a federal court of racketeering and fraud under statutes previously used on mobsters. By October, the California EPA had classified secondhand smoke as a toxic air contaminant. Ruthie? But before that, the first week in April, the Arkansas legislature, during a special session, moted by a conservative executive with national ambitions and delusions of grandeur, passed a very flawed and very weak clean indoor air law. This law is riddled with what are now indefensible exemptions. And I could li I've got list as time allows. I could list. Uh, Specifically, Act 8 of 2006 exempts franchisees of the Arkansas Racing Commission. The TSI AM510 Sidebeck Aerosol Monitor is basically a small vacuum that uses a laser photometer to measure the particulates of a certain size. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg Protocol involves five to 10 minutes sampling outside the venue to measure the ambient air and at least a half hour inside each venue. Field notes record an estimation of the size of the room, the number of people and the number of smokers, any other potential sources of particulates. 
day before yesterday, I would have spelled discreet differently, but I was reading a, a, one of these mystery novels that I spent too much time on, and that's the, the protocol insists that the observation be surreptitious and discreet. The idea is you don't want to call attention to yourself. <laughs> which of course is easier for some than others. Okay, Ruthie. Oaklawn, uh, the PM 2.5 measurement outside the ambient air, outside the ambient air, outside at Oaklawn, which included a ride in a gas powered trolley in a parking lot adjacent to the busy Central Avenue was 28.1 micrometers per meter cubed. One more, Oaklawn is unique in that visitor, uh, Go back one, please. Oaklawn is unique in that visitors see this sign at the front door and it's placed prominently throughout the building and in the program. It infers that the smoking and non-smoking sections are dictated by Act 8. It begins by saying the Clean Air Act of 2006 forbids smoking in almost all workplaces and ends thanking guests for complying with the law. Oaklawn is exempt from Act 8. This is, this is public relations uh, trying to shirk their responsibility for having an unsafe environment. Uh, the facility is used, huge. It's nearly a quarter mile long with several levels. The smell of tobacco smoke is immediately evident. Smoking and non-smoking sections are separated by signage only. Escalators and stairs act as chimney funneling smoke throughout the facility. And just stop there, go back, please, Ruthie. You can see the, oh, this is the right slide, but this is downstairs from the, our first measurement, the non-smoking mezzanine. And you can see they're smoking right outside the stairs. They come up right to the, that area there. Our first half hour sampling was in the upstairs non-smoking mezzanine. As you can see, it's open to the theater seating. Data collected here yield 143 micrometers per meter cubed, nearly triple EPA safe standards. And let's go to the casino. The casino at Oakland has some of the most ludicrous smoking and non-smoking sections separated by signs and carpet. You can see <laughs> at the time of sampling, there were approximately 500 guests with maybe 35 to 40 smoking. The PM 2.5 was 91 micrometers per meter cubed. Another distinction for Oakland is that they allow children inside. This measurement was taken in the northern track level smoking section where anyone entering from the northern turnstiles or if they have to park in the northern parking lot, they must pass through this section to view the horses. The PM 2.5 measurement was 260 micrometers per meter cubed. Oakland is the only business in the state that fails to protect children from secondhand smoke. Ambient air outside of Southland, 200 yards from I-40, was 22.3 micrometers per meter cubed. All visitors must pass through the gaming section to view the dog races. Again, the tobacco smoke was immediately evident. The Southland Casino is probably triple the size. Let's see, are we maybe one back? There we go. The Southland Casino is triple the size of Oakland, about triple the size of Oakland. At the time of sampling, there were approximately 1,000 guests and one in 10 were smoking. PM 2.5 was 165 micrometers per meter cube. Southland makes no obvious claim to any non-smoking section in the casino. Here we go. Upstairs from the casino are the simulcast bedding windows and theater seating for the dog racing. PM 2.5 there was 293 micrometers per meter cube. That's over 800% of the maximum EPA standards for safe air. There are inherent limitations to this short study. These are half hour samplings. The EPA standards are based on a 24 hour average. Only one machine was used and it could have been miscalibrated. The data does not prove that secondhand smoke caused these high PM 2.5 numbers. We know that this type of particulate generally comes as a result of factories, automobiles, forest fires and secondhand smoke. We know from comparing the outside measurements that something interior to the venues caused the high numbers, but without further study, we cannot say that something else interior to the venue is not responsible. There could have been some really, really bad funnel cake fryers causing the affluent, <laughs> but without further study, it, it most likely is secondhand smoke. 
Our summary and recommendations, all sampling exceeded EPA safe standard for fine particulates. The air within these facilities is unsafe for employees and guests. The data in this paper could lead to one or more of several actions, including but not limited to the Racinos voluntarily making their facilities smoke free or rescinding exemptions to Arkansas's Clean Indoor Air Act. One more. The tobacco industry has yet to admit their culpability. Our flawed tobacco policies only serve to continue the subsidy that businesses like Oaklawn and Southland offer the tobacco industry. The numerous exemptions in Arkansas's clean indoor air law should never have been there in the first place. The risk of death from heart disease or lung cancer should never be a condition of patronage or employment. We've written a paper, you can go with the last one here. We've written a paper uh, and submitted it to a professional journal. I owe great thanks to my co-authors, uh, Dr. Thaddeus Barter, Dr. Gary Wheeler, Tika Barter, Dr. Matt Stelliga, Julie and Catherine, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.